do, 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 do. Howdy everyone and welcome to the Serial Geek TV YouTube channel. My name is James Etock and today we're going to take a look at what I believe to be is one of the best, if not the best, episode of Inspector Gadget, Gadget in Winterland, also known as Winter Olympics. Truthfully, I was never much of a fan of Inspector Gadget. I like the idea of the character and the basic premise of the series, of which I will always have a soft spot for, but the show itself felt repetitive. I realise that one can voice that criticism towards any cartoon of the 80s in which the heroes always triumph over the villains. However, with Inspector Gadget, the actual structure and, at times, dialogue was the same from episode to episode. From memory, I can say with confidence that an episode of Inspector Gadget would follow this rarely deviated specific structure. The episode would open up with Inspector Gadget, Penny and Brain, either at home or in a different country. At some point, a disguised Chief Quimby would hand Gadget his mission. Gadget would read it, hand it back to him, and Quimby would be the victim of an explosion. Gadget would then set out on his mission, with Penny telling Brain to follow him. Inspector Gadget would begin his task by following all the wrong leads. At some point, Gadget would see Brain in disguise and pursue him, believing him to be a mad agent. During this pursuit, which would usually occur during the course of the second act, Penny would foil mad schemes via her computer book. Shortly thereafter, Gadget would inadvertently arrive, usually by crashing onto the scene and into the mad agents themselves. At that point, Chief Quimby and his fellow officers would turn up, thank Gadget, who would never even question the presence of Penny and Brain, and Dr. Claw would fly off into the distance, vowing vengeance. Rarely would an episode break away from this structure, and for me, that is where the series falters. As a child, I remember being rather bored by the show. I liked Inspector Gadget's numerous gadgets and the antics of Brain, but the repetitive way in which the stories were told almost made watching any given episode feel like a chore. Surprisingly, one of the things I didn't like about the series was Inspector Gadget himself. I always found him to be a rather unlikable hero. Here was a guy that would talk down to his niece, bungle his way through a mission, accidentally save the day, and then, worst of all, take all of the credit. Compare Inspector Gadget to a male lead like He-Man or Optimus Prime or lion -O. I know that Inspector Gadget is presented as a different sort of hero, but his actions throughout the series, even to this day, make me feel like he was always missing something personality-wise. And this is where the pilot episode of the series comes into play, but first, a little bit of history. Having set up Deke Entertainment in 1982, Andy Haywood developed the idea and character of Inspector Gadget. Haywood wrote the pilot episode with Jean Chalapin, which was completed before the end of 1982, a year prior to the debut of the syndicated series. Chalapin helped further develop the format and concept for the series, alongside Bruno Bianchi, who not only finalised the character designs, but also served as supervising director. As an episode of Inspector Gadget, the pilot itself is incredibly refreshing. While it may start off the same, once Inspector Gadget has been handed his mission, the story steers clear of the rigid structure that we would become rather accustomed to throughout the series. The episode itself, which takes place in Winterland, sees Inspector Gadget, Penny and Brain on holiday. Gadget is on vacation and appears to be enjoying every second of it, although his first appearance in the episode sees him tumbling down a ski slope accompanied by Brain. Chief Quimby, voiced here by the late, great and ridiculously versatile John Stevenson, soon appears and warns Gadget that Dr. Claw is in Winterland. What is interesting to note is that in this first of three appearances by Quimby, he doesn't outline what Mad's specific plan is, making the story a little more intriguing. Dr. Claw sends the Mad Yodeler, whom Gadget stops by accident, not realising that he is dealing with an agent of Mad. A subsequent avalanche caused by Gadget's yodeling prompts the mad yodeler to flee for his life, with Gadget still unaware of the situation that has just taken place. Whilst enjoying some skiing, Gadget is once again given a mission by Quimby. This time, the mission is more explicit, informing Gadget that a mad agent is carrying dynamite and plans to blow up the Olympic torch. Gadget races into action, closely followed by Brain. Although Gadget prevents the mad agent from succeeding in his mission, Brain decides to comically play fetch and causes both he and Gadget to be blown up by the dynamite. Having foiled the second of Mad's schemes, Gadget takes Penny and Brain for skiing lessons. 
Dr. Claw diverts Gadget into his castle and subsequently into his cable car, in which the floor gives way, saving himself Penny and Brain and enduring yet another mad trap. Inspector Gadget then receives his third and final mission of the episode from Chief Quimby. Surveying all of Winterland via a ski lift, Gadget becomes aware that he is being followed. Brain, disguised as a penguin, follows Gadget but is outwitted by his master. Just as Gadget is about to arrest Brain, the pair are confronted by the abominable Snowbot. Gadget manages to prevent the mad creature from disrupting the Winter Olympics, and Penny manages to override the creature's circuits, causing it to destroy Dr. Claw's base of operations. One of the most interesting aspects is the way in which the episode is broken down into many different acts. You can often spot the end of an act with the use of the final few bars of the theme song. Due to this structuring, the episode feels as if it is comprised of lots of little adventures rather than two acts that comprise a single story. By far the most visually noteworthy aspect of the pilot episode is that Inspector Gadget sports a moustache, as this was a part of his original character design. Now if you'll allow me to deviate for a moment I'll tell you how I stumbled upon the pilot as it was quite by accident and involved Spider-Man. Over here in the UK, circa 1995, Sky One would air the 1967 Spider-Man cartoon followed by Inspector Gadget on a daily basis. It was shown super early in the morning so I would have to set the timer on the VHS to record it. Remember those days? I would record every episode of that Spider-Man cartoon because I loved and still love that show. However, one morning I must have set the timer a little wrong and it continued to record the episode of Inspector Gadget that followed Spider-Man. I was watching the tape one evening and continued to let it play in the background. I'll never forget looking at the screen only to see Inspector Gadget sporting a moustache during the introduction sequence. As a longtime fan of animation production, even back then I knew something was up. In between the pilot and the series, the decision was made to remove Inspector Gadget's moustache. However, along with his moustache, they removed certain elements of his personality that I believe were detrimental to the character. Upon first glance, aside from the moustache, Inspector Gadget would appear to be the same character he has always been. However, nothing could be further from the truth. This Inspector Gadget is actually rather competent at his job. When the episode first begins and we see Gadget and Brain crashing down the ski slope, it feels like your typical episode of Inspector Gadget. But as the episode progresses, this Gadget is somewhat different. He is extremely proactive in that as soon as he receives each mission from Chief Quimby, he leaps into action. By far the scene in this episode that simply would not appear in your typical episode of Inspector Gadget occurs when the mad agent is carrying the dynamite towards the Olympic torch. Gadget, upon Quimby's mission orders, immediately spots the mad agent and, more importantly, recognises him to be a mad agent, something he would never do in the series, even if the agent had mad written across his chest. Not only does he recognise the mad agent, but he actually outrightly foils the mad agent with no contributions from either Penny or Brain. Even more astounding is that as Gadget saves the day and carries the dynamite away from the Olympic torch, it is Brain, the reliable, intelligent character, that actually bungles his attempt to save the day. Every time Gadget tosses the dynamite away, Brain brings it back to him, believing that his master is playing fetch. The personalities of both Gadget and Brain are reversed in this scene when compared to the series. In the very same scene, as Gadget attempts to evade the returning dynamite, he leaps into a toboggan. Aware that Gadget is on his way, a mad agent pours oil onto the toboggan run. Once more showing his awareness, Gadget sees the oil slick and uses his coiled legs to walk over it. Throughout the series, Gadget would remain clueless upon seeing Dr. Claw escape, often making an ignorant comment, causing Penny and Brain to wince. On this occasion, as Dr. Claw escapes in his rocket ship, Gadget immediately recognises it to be the villain's ship. Look over there, Brain! It's Dr. Claw's shovel! <laughs> Gadget's mistakes in the series were often a result of his ineptitude, but in the pilot they can often be attributed to the actions of others. Another interesting aspect of the character is how he is perceived by others. In the series he is not often recognised, but in the pilot any and all characters that come into contact with him instantly know who he is. 
This could, of course, be simply played for humour as Gadget is supposed to be on vacation. Also, Brain's bungling causes Gadget to be laughed out by his fellow police officers in one specific scene. This kind of reaction to the character would never occur in the series as the police all believed Gadget to be highly proficient at his job. One of the most surprising things about the pilot is the voice of Inspector Gadget himself. In the series, Don Adams lent his unique vocal tones to the lead character, crafting an iconic voice, so much so that it's hard to picture anyone else in the role, even after the passing of Adams. However, in the pilot, the baritone well-spoken voice of Gary Owens can be heard, and prior to Gary Owens, actor Jesse White was chosen for the role, hence why his name pops up in the end credits. Sadly, the version of the episode with White in the lead role has yet to be uncovered. The difference is rather startling, especially when combined with the way in which Gadget is written in this episode. Gadget's high-pitched voice in the series was played for comedy value and only helped to exude his bumbling ways. It was rare that we ever took anything the character said seriously. Gary Owen's Inspector Gadget exudes charisma and authority, something the character in the series not once demonstrated. Here, even when things are going wrong, his voice is calm and collected, rather than yelling insanely as he would normally do. In the series, Penny and Brain's presence from the beginning of an episode to the very end is both an important and prominent one. In this episode, their presence is just the same, but the way in which they are used, primarily due to the structure of the episode and competency of Gadget, is different. Penny for the most part, plays a spectator role, rarely using her computer book to fight the villains and not once finding herself in a situation in which she is either confronting a mad agent or located in Mad's base of operations. In this episode, Penny is as much a background character as Chief Quimby. Her one major contribution to the episode is when she overrides the abominable Snowbot circuitry, but by this point Gadget has already saved the Olympics from harm. Brain, like Gadget, is interesting in that he acts differently from the series. Naturally, he is sent out on more than one occasion by Penny to follow Gadget and ensure that he stays out of trouble. However, due to Gadget's awareness in this episode, Brain's following of his master almost seems unnecessary. Even more so when you consider that Brain is actually rather a hindrance and inadvertently causes more harm than good. This is most notable in the aforementioned scene in which Brain decides to foolishly play fetch with the dynamite that Gadget is attempting to dispose of. This is not something that Brain would do in the series, as he was a far more intelligent character, K9, that recognised the threat in any shape or form. In the series, in some bizarre way, this scene would have played out in reverse, with Brain trying to get rid of the dynamite and Gadget being the one to bring it back into play. Even at the very end of the episode, when the characters are delivering the public service announcement, Brain bungles proceedings by leaping on Inspector Gadget, causing him to fall over. When looking at the interaction between Brain and Gadget, one would have to say that Brain plays more of a bumbling sidekick role in the pilot. Visually, this episode is stronger than most in the series. The animation is constant and consistently smooth and crisp. Although, like in the series, it is animated in Japan, this episode looks and feels more like a European cartoon, harkening back to Deke's French-based origins. It is clear that the budget for this pilot was much higher than the budget for any episode of the series, which is often the case with pilot productions. The one area in which the visuals are flawed is the lip sync. Presumably, this pilot was animated with a French audio track, as the lip sync rarely ever matches the dialogue. Remember kids? Snow sports provide us with good exercise and fun, but like any sport, you should be careful so you don't get hurt. In a bizarre way, the pilot looks like a cartoon that has been picked up by an American studio for distribution and dubbed with an English voice cast. When the series was picked up for syndication, Don Adams revoiced all of Gary Owen's dialogue in this episode. Of course, Penny, I'm taking one week's vacation and I'm absolutely, completely, and totally off duty. Oh, for sure, for sure! That's the top secret gadget phone! Of course, Penny, I'm taking one week's vacation and I'm absolutely, completely, and totally off duty. Holy mountain goat! That's the top secret gadget phone! Although the voice takes away some of the charisma and authority displayed by Owen's voice, the dialogue and context of the story still result in a differing lead character. 
Interestingly, the introduction sequence of the pilot was revised and a large chunk in which Gadget was seen actively engaging with MAD in a proactive context was removed and replaced with clips from the pilot. My belief is that they removed these scenes as, much like the pilot itself, it showed Inspector Gadget in a favourable light. The pilot was revised once more, again for syndication. This time the introduction sequence featuring the moustached Inspector Gadget was replaced completely by the regular introduction. An interesting further edit was made to this third version of the pilot in a scene in which Gadget and Penny exchange dialogue. In the first two versions of this episode, a disbelieving Penny asks her uncle if his current whereabouts are truly unknown to Chief Quimby. Gadget confirms this information and reiterates that he is taking one week's vacation. In the third version of the pilot, rather than inquiring about Chief Quimby, Penny states that she likes Inspector Gadget's new moustache, to which he replies that it's to ensure that nobody will recognise him whilst on vacation. Obviously, this dialogue was added in order to explain away Gadget's differing appearance, but most interestingly of all, Gadget is voiced in this one scene by the ever-versatile Frank Welker, who was, of course, the voice of Dr. Claw. You know, Uncle, I really like your new mustache. Thanks, Penny. It's so that nobody will recognize me. I'm on vacation, absolutely, completely, and totally off duty. Holy Mountain Goat, that's the top secret gadget phone. Why the changes were made to the character of Inspector Gadget will probably always remain a mystery. No doubt Deke thought it would be better to have an incompetent lead character than a competent one. Peter Saunder was the head writer on the series and was not involved in the pilot, with Haywood taking a step back from the series. This change may have affected the writing of the character. Of course, one of the most probable reasons is that our dear Inspector bore more of a resemblance to a certain Inspector Clouseau, and, much like Gadget, he too had had a lobotomy of sorts. The differences between the pilot and the series are more than striking, so much so that I would not hesitate to say that, having seen the entire series, the pilot is actually my favourite episode because it is so different. It presents us with a lead character that is competent, at times heroic and rather likeable, a character that does not take credit for something he has played no part in. The fact that Penny and Brain have reduced roles is also something I enjoy about this episode. The structure of the story shines with smaller, more exciting plots taking place rather than a lengthy drawn out plot in which Inspector Gadget remains clueless. So for me, the most interesting aspect of the Inspector Gadget series will always be the pilot episode that came before. And that is the end. Thank you for watching this video. Please be sure to like, comment, share and subscribe.